here we are back at you podcast world chad belly another episode of the foul life podcast fueled powered by Wildfowl Outdoor Sportsman's Group, the 2020-21 gear issue. It's in your mailboxes. It's on your newsstands. Get it. Open it up. Let's all become better stewards of the land, better waterfowl hunters. Let's get our passion going. It's almost a season. The dog days of summer are almost over. Today, I got my co-host, Skip Knowles, the brand manager, editor-in-chief of Wildfowl Magazine, Gun Dog Magazine, Outdoor Sportsman's Group, and the one and only, back again, Fred Zink, the master of, I don't know, pretty much everything in this industry since the year 1997, 98, 99, 2000 is the year I met Fred Zink, and he took me under his wing, and then I was able to learn a lot, and for that, I'm humbled. Today, he is going to tell us how blinds have evolved, how people's insight and the way that people try to execute with blinds, it used to be to where you would build up a sagebrush line and hide on the edge. And then Freddie come up with this idea in the Ron Latshaw days of hiding in the middle of the field, but not digging a pit blind like you can in some states such as Skip Knowles, alma mater of Colorado. But he put, developed these ground blinds that you would lay down in and the geese would come in or the mallards would come in and they'd have no idea that you were hiding out there amongst a big spread of decoys, full body mallard decoys, full body goose decoys, which Fred Zink is also revolutionary in designing in the last 15 to 20 years. So here we are, another part of the gear issue, and we're going into blinds. Fred Zink, welcome, first of all, and please, after you say your welcoming speech, are blinds still relevant? Are they still important? Because everybody says you have to be where the ducks are. You have to be where the geese are. You have to scout like a mofo, but you have to hide, right? You still have to hide from them. They still have good eyesight in 2020, right? Oh, yeah. It's, it's gotten uh, even uh, more more difficult today, as you well know, you know, but I appreciate you having me on. And uh, Skip, always good to see you, my friend. Uh, you know, the revolutionary start of the ground blinds, uh, Started a long, long time ago. I remember the first one I ever seen uh, that really caught my eye. It was called it was uh, uh, it's called a mummy blind. All right, a mummy boat. I don't know if you guys remember that or whatever. They were fiberglass. I think they were made in Louisiana, uh, and they were just a marsh boat. You know that you put grass on them. And uh, I remember just seeing them. They look like a coffin, coffin blind, a mummy blind, what have you. Back in the days, I'm talking like in the 80s, right? And prior to that, I know I told you the story about um, my dad took a picture window, like a big round bay window out of our house when I think it was like 10 or 12 years old. I took all the gra grass or a glass out of it and put wood in it. And I used it for a blackbird, like a lay down blind blackbird blind back in like, uh, I'd say about 77, 78, something like that. You know, it was mobile. Um, but it's just, it's come around. There's so many different things. I was looking, I know you know the name Brian Sullivan uh, from Southern Illinois. Um, he came up hunting with me in the 90s, early 90s. And I had made my own lay down blinds at that point, just out of chicken wire. It was just round, you know, and put weave natural grass into it. And you just lay on your, you couldn't see anything. But uh, it was kind of the first step of, of uh, a lay down blind per se. And the first production lay down blind I ever seen personally was Ron Winicky. I mean, Ron Winicky was a, you know, he's, he's since passed, but he was a very innovative guy. Woods games calls. He had the sitting goose chair. I don't remember that one with the big shell decoy. He designed that. And then he had this uh, ground blind called a uh, ready in position RIP blind. Um, it was like leaf of flage. It was square box and it had a seat belt retractor. You pulled it up, it was over your head and you hit it and it just flew down I seen that blind like uh, that had been in the '90s, and then Latchall come out with a special purpose slider. You remember that thing? It was huge, and it was like seven ninety nine, eight hundred dollar blind, you know. And I think it was like ninety three, ninety two, ninety three when I seen that blind. Ron sent me one. I'd met him, uh, Tim and Tim Grounds and myself had met him, and uh, you know, so it was like the start of all the ground blinds and being mobile. Prior to that, everybody fence row hunted them, you know, a big stand-up blind or hiding in the fence row. And ducks and geese were very, very educated to edge hunting at that point, you know. And if you could just get out in the middle of the field, the, like the big mega states where waterfowling was crucial, Arkansas, Illinois, Maryland, a lot of those places, Kentucky, southern Kentucky, um, would have pit lines, you know, the Cadillac. But as you travel across the Canada to – you know, even back in the day in Canada, they had these great big telephone, they called them auger holes. You know, have you ever hunted out one of those? 
Chad. Yeah, the circle holes just around auger yeah. going down and creating. Yeah, it's just a huge auger, and they, especially in the spec, uh, hunting specs or whatever, they go out the night before and dig these auger holes, and you just really stood in them, right? And then fill them back in. But, you know, just to be mobile and all that stuff, the revolution, the revolution of the ground blinds, like I say, it started with, you know, people making one offs and like even layout blinds or layout boats. I grew up hunting in the open water for divers and layout boats since I've been nine years old. You know, my dad and I actually built, this is probably kind of a side story, but it's a pretty cool story. We built a two man pumpkin seed. Uh, my grandfather had passed away. My dad was remodeling the house, right? My dad was a construction worker or had a construction company. And I think it was like 10, 10 or 12 years old. We got this plan and we built this two man pumpkin seed in the kitchen of my grandpa's house while it was being remodeled, you know, and we got, so if you like pull the linoleum up and look underneath it, we got the pattern drew, drawn on the floor and we just made it all there, fiberglass it, went to take it out of, out of the uh, the kitchen outside and it wouldn't go out the door. So we had to take the door off the house to get the boat out. But, you know, being low profile, not having a shadow, uh, it's been around forever, you know, especially in open water hunting divers, you know, skull boats and stuff like that. So you just take that technology and the 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 one manufacturer and the person that probably drove it more than anything in the beginning is, uh, was Ron Latchall with final approach. No doubt about it. I just remember the conversation he sent, uh, me the special purpose slider. It was, to be honest with you, it was kind of cool, but it was huge. And it was heavy. And it was $800, man. And I went to every show I knew point Malay, all the shows, all the calling contests. I lugged that thing everywhere. I couldn't sell them. It was just too expensive. And so he's like, man, I want to make in this business what I got to do. I said, man, you got to have a blind that's like 400 bucks and a lot smaller, more compact. And it was like, uh, I don't know, maybe a month later, I get a box. He said, I'm sending you something. And he sent me a box. And it was the very first eliminator ever made. I still have it, actually. And it had a uh, old school seat, not the hammock style seat or anything in it, you know, but the original concept Ron come up with of that full frame closed floor everything angled size or whatever and he sent that to me and uh we started brainstorming and coming up with the hammock style seat this is on all ground blinds i helped ron de design and develop that and then uh ron wasn't a caller by by no mean no stretch of the imagination you know what i mean and so you couldn't call like the first eliminators when you blew your goose call you were literally had to open the door or you're actually calling into the inside of the blind so we come up with a pro guide which was obviously kind of the standard of what most ground blinds are built around some way today. Lowered headrest, the arms were further forward, bigger gap, mesh windows, a lot of things like that. And that way you could blow your goose call, especially a short read outside the blind. You know what I mean? And uh, that was just kind of the evolution of, of how ground blinds got started way back in the 90s. When was that, Fred, roughly? What year? I would say that would be in the 90s, like 93, 94. It was, it was 93, right it was 92, 93 for sure, because yep. that was like right after this, the VHS tapes that Winnicky had out of Oshkosh, Nebraska. I remember him, I remember him in the camera vividly. They're off the water, boys. They're off the water. And he'd run in and, 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 and I don't remember the name of them, Zinc. Do you remember the name of those, the, his, his video series before you started doing 24-7? He oh, had the, he, ah, I, can't, I can't, I can't remember. But Freddie, quick, quick Twitch question. Rank in order of importance in today's waterfowl world. And I, I don't want to put boat blinds in there because that's obviously a totally different animal, but you've had a lot to do with boat blinds and, and helping, you know, master the design of those and perfect the design of the boat blinds as we know it today. Panel blinds, ground blinds, pit blinds, those three, it's a high school test. You got to put them in order of importance to today's waterfowler. How do they go? I think probably, to be honest with you, a panel blind would probably be number one, simply because it's so versatile across all waterfowl hunting. You know, marsh hunting, uh, standing in cattails, slough, grass slough in, in the Canadian prairies, uh, edge hunting. Just very, very, very versatile. Uh, and then I would rank the ground blind a close second simply because you can do all that as well. You know what I mean? The pit blind is the most effective, no, no question, but it's pretty impractical, practical for most people. You know what I mean? It, most people don't own the property that they're hunting. 
know what I mean? So it's not, you either own it or lease it. And that rules out probably 85, 90% of the waterfowlers. Can you still kill big Canadian geese honkers, nine to 12, 13 pounders in the middle of a field out of a ground blind? Not just you personally, but on average, have geese gotten used to a ground blind to where now all of a sudden Fred Zink goes, oh, okay, I'm starting. Did you, did you notice something Zink that you're like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to start doing something different. I'm going to develop this panel right. blind idea with the frame. Did you see something that a light bulb went off your head? And you're like, man, geese just aren't doing it like they used to do when I was in Saskatchewan in 2004, 2005. Yeah. I mean, I, I see it change. Uh, I remember I, I, uh, hired field Hudnell. He was my first full-time zinc calls employee. And I think that would have been mm, 2002, somewhere in there. Um, uh, some, uh, 2001, 2002. And field come up from Kentucky and uh, started working for us, making calls and all that stuff. And we, we was goose hunting, you know. And this is, we're talking September, right? Geese come over the, uh, the uh, tree line, whiffling in, get almost to us, whoosh, flare right out. And he's like, what's going on? It's like, he's ground blinds. He's like, what? I go, oh, yeah. You know, so that was in the early 2000s. They started figuring it out. And when we started filming, we would get down to where we would only run uh, one to two ground blinds in the field. And I'm talking about in the Midwest here in Ohio, where I live uh, in the early to mid 2000s, we'd only run probably two ground blinds, two shooters. Everybody else would stay in the truck and we just cycle in and out. If you had more than that, they just knew, you know, they could they just pick them out. You've been up in Canada with us when it was some days the right, wrong light. There's a lot of things to it. I think some of it has to do with lighting, Something that has to do with the printing of camo. Uh, I personally believe 100% that waterfowl see much differently than us um, in certain light conditions. And we all been out there long enough to know I can get up in the morning personally and know if we're going to kill them or not just by understanding the light conditions. And uh, I personally think that they can see certain types of print. Uh, like the new, the, all the new stuff, a majority of the new stuff, and I've done a lot of testing with this. Um, a lot of the new prints are uh, heat transfer because the camouflage is much prettier than what it used to be. And it's, it's basically like a giant sticker it comes together and it, it's called a heat transfer. I, those inks are much different than the old wet print. Like if you can take like a cotton, old cotton jacket or shirt made way back in the day, and you can take it right out there and lay it in your uh, decoy spread and it'll land on it. I, I personally don't think they can see that. But some of the new polyesters, depending on the substrate and all that, the way they're printed uh, with certain lights, I think they take on a UV glow. And because I've done testing where I had jackets, I had bags of jackets, different ones, right? It would be on the day where the geese are just coming, certain light conditions, and and, uh, and we're shooting the hell out of them. I take a jacket out, st- take it out there and sit over a decoy and they'd be flaring at 80 yards. You know what I mean? And it looked pretty good to the human eye, but the geese could see. ducks. Uh, totally different game. I don't think obviously, I don't think they can see UV nowhere near like uh, a goose for sure. And I think uh, the goose that can see it the most, in my opinion, is a speckle belly. And it just really? they see much differently than we do. So there's a lot to it. About I remember when you know, when we're all working at Avery, like Matthews would want us to have all the latest greatest ground blinds every year. You know, oh, you can't use your old one; you got to have a new one. I think a ground blind is like a good pair, of, like a good half. The more you use it, the better it gets. And um, I always take and mud my ground blinds as much as possible. Number one, I'm trying to tend it into the, the color of the dirt in which I'm hunting. But number two, I'm trying to kill that UV. Anything that's a little bit discolored, especially in certain light conditions. And then we got to talk about shadows and all that stuff. But I'm talking about a blue, hazy day when there's a little moisture in the area. Uh, it can be a nightmare. Um, low light conditions, uh, believe it or not, with geese, uh, and you've seen it in Canada many, many times, both of you, specks come out uh, well before sunrise. A lot of times they'll flare off you time after time after time. You can barely see them, but they can see you. Sun gets up a little higher, specks are dumb as a box of rocks up there, but in certain light conditions early in the morning, it can be very, very difficult. I think it's because of UV. 
And that's when a lot of guys think something's wrong. They got to get out, change the decoy spread. Yeah. They start to go into panic mode. And it's all about the timing and that light and that, that, that the shadows and the right, what you're saying, the right time that the sun's going to hit that spread. And it's almost like, Hey, just calm down, pump the brakes. It's going to happen. But when you talk about camo, you just mentioned mudding. I remember being out in, in Port Clinton and sitting out there with the hoses and five gallon buckets and just a hut field and clay and you and I, before a trip, you're just nonstop mudding. Is the camouflage on a ground blind from the from the late nineties to the early two thousands, Freddie? Was it just for shelf appeal and for people to feel good that they're buying something with camouflage on it? If you're gonna mud it and take that sheen and that UV probability away from it, why would they be printed in camo in the first place? Well, I think my 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 all time favorite camo for ground blinds was the old original mossy oak shadow grass, simply because of just it was a dirty, dingy, it looked old. Right. It just had that it had that river bottom muddy look. Right. And it kind of blended in about anywhere. I think two things. There's there's a bunch of different reasons why you should mud your blind. Uh, if you're in Oklahoma, uh, that blind's not going to blend in very well because you got red dirt. Right. If you're in central Illinois, you got that black soil. It's going to be too light. So you would have to you need to mud, mud your blinds or rub dirt into it in areas in which you hunt. You make sure you tent that camouflage. Uh, to the color that that you need, right? You got to have that good earth tone to begin with. That's number one. Number two, it takes down the shine. The original ground blinds way back in the day, Latchell's final approach blinds, they were made out Cordura. That's an old name. That's a, it's a name that's gone now, right? Nobody uses it. And Cordura didn't have a shine. Uh, the problem is with Cordura material is when it was hot, it would be loose. When it was cold, it would shrink right? So your ground blinds, it was hard to control the look and the feel of your ground blinds because it would move around so much, but from the heat and and the cold weather. And uh, and then to come up with polyester, which is what all ground blinds are made today, usually 900, 600 denier polyester. Uh, Very, very durable, doesn't change in in weathers as far as getting large or, or shrinking or whatever, but it has a sheen and a shine to it. And that's what mudding or uh, making your, your blind dirty is, is all about is get rid of that sheen. You want to make it, you want to look like the dirt, you know? So the question was, why is camouflage versus why not buy a khaki blind or whatever? The contrast of camo, a good camouflage for a ground blind gives you that contrast and depth of layers and something to build on. And, and I always preferred camo over a straight khaki blind, me personally. I just thought it blended in better once mudded properly. Now, a brand new ground blind, never mudded, grassed up, half ass, not very good. Just not very effective. So if the U.S. Fish and Wildlife called your office in Port Clinton tomorrow morning, or let's say this coming Monday, and said, Fred, we need to hire you to go to Saskatchewan for 30 days from September 15th to October 10th, let's say, 25 days, this coming September, you're not going up there to kill them. You're going up there to land them. And we need you to study the different texture of a Canada goose's cheek patch compared to a lesser compared to a greater. I'm just making this up as I go. The point is, is you got to land them and get them tight. What's in your trailer to hide from those geese right now in 2020? Cause I know what was in your trailer in 2005, 15 yeah. years later, when I put down that ramp in that back door in Fred Zink's trailer, what am I going to find to hide with? In 2020, I would definitely to get the geese have as have close A- as we possibly can. Sorry, yeah, I would definitely have A frames, especially hunting geese. But you're hunting ducks. Ground blinds are still hard to beat. You know what I mean? Uh, ground blinds are hard to. I wouldn't say hard to beat, but extremely effective. Ducks, ducks just typically don't get it. They're not as smart uh, to that as as, as geese. Um, geese are extremely wise, um, and and I totally believe. And, and this would be a question for a biologist, but. You know, the geese, they still travel together. They're still family groups, right? So you got mom and dad and you got the young of the year. With the ducks, you know, I don't know if the young of the year follow uh, the mom and dad all the way down the flyaway like geese. Geese are very, very family-oriented birds or waterfowl. And there's a lot of smart birds in that flock, you know what I mean? So it's just a little bit different situation. Um, I I believe they can see UV. And I think a a stand-up panel blind, A-frame, willow blind, in my opinion, today is way more effective than ground blinds unless you're hunting snow geese and you're running, you know, 500, 1,000 
decoys where you just basically white it out. You know what I mean? To where you can't see the ground blinds. You just have so many decoys, you can't see them. A little different situation. When you talk about panel blinds, Fred Zink, what does the term false line mean? As, a, as a, you're going out and you got a group of hunters, and I, I don't know if you call it something different, but you're trying to emulate things that are in there. There's a rock pile over there. There's a tree right. line over there. There's a brush pile over here. What is a false line and how important is it to take the time to develop that false line with your blind to match into the rest of the topography from a bird's eye view, looking down on that certain area that you're trying to execute your hunt on. Does that make sense when you hear false line? No, I never heard that terminology before, but explain it a different way. <laughs> I, I always called it, a, I've called it a false line of like, it's not real, but it's still in line with what's out there. So we would go okay, and develop, if, if, if there's trees around, we would you're probably try to other nature. Yeah, yes. I got okay. you. I got you. Um, I think it's extremely important to try to find, I, I typically will find and or hunt a field that I know I can hide in that has less geese than a field that's completely covered with them that I don't think it can hide in. Because we started, you started on this question, we got off the subject. So what's the most important things in waterfowling? Number one is location, uh, without a doubt. You have to be in the right location. But number two, and it's the one that's overlooked probably by more waterfowlers, I don't care if you're boat line hunting, or field hunting, or what kind of hunting you're doing is camouflage. I think people want to talk about decoys. And they want to talk about calls. They typically don't want to talk about scouting, and they don't want to talk about uh, camouflage. But those two right there are the most important part of a successful hunt day in, day out, 100%. You know. So with that being said is blending into an area. So I'll look. Now, you got to think when you're in Canada and you're hunting lessers, you're hunting uh, mallards, specks, uh, snows, those birds are not locals, right? They're migrating and they might be gone today. They might've just got here today. They don't know a lot about the field they're feeding in, right? They're just following, they play follow the leader, right? And so you can move those birds around that field because they have no idea where the food is at or where the food is not at. So if there's a couple thousand geese in there, I'll pick a spot in that field that that's close to where they're feeding, but more importantly, I'll use a roll in the field. I'll use a, a grass line, uh, a tree line, anything that I can to move those birds around to a location where I can hide from them. Way more important than being on the X. Now, when you're hunting honkers that have been there every day, and, and then this doesn't matter if you're in the U.S. or you're in Canada, those honkers go there every day and feed. They know where the food is at and where they know where the food is not at. And you better be on the X or the honkers. Just a totally bit different ball game. And so you have to take a totally different approach to hunt all that, you know. Location is key, but it's not as important as camouflage if you can't hide. But you just took the X to a different level, Skip. I think I heard Fred just say that uh, most people, I think, would say the X is being in the field that they scouted the night before and they saw honkers in there. But now you're saying that the X is actually where the food is because those honkers are going to pinpoint that and they're going to shortstop you or they're going to go past you if you're not on the actual One, X. Uh, 100%. 100, I, I got driveway reflectors uh, in my trailers or my trucks. Just, a, you know, it's a three, four foot long driveway reflector. Um, and I'll watch that field until dusk. And I'll wait till they all leave, except for maybe, you know, last little family group or whatever. And I'll drive out with a four wheeler or drive in there with my truck and I'll push them out and put that reflector right where they were at. Uh, so when I go there at four o'clock in the morning, you ain't out, you know, hey, that porch light in it. No, that don't work. You got to be like right on the exact spot. No different than hunting a willow slew for ducks. If you're off 30 yards, 30 feet makes a difference between an unbelievable hunt and an okay hunt because those ducks are hitting exactly in the same spot. Canada geese, big honkers know exactly where the food is at. And you, if you're off 80 yards, it ain't going to just happen. for mine, just for my personal validation and knowledge and skip might want to know the answer to this too. Why in a willow marsh for mallards? What is it? The water depth? Is it, is, is there food different in different areas? They know that marsh that well, that they're going to light in this certain spot. Is it the wind or why are you saying that you could be off 30 yards in a willow marsh with ducks when you just said before that ducks probably aren't as smart as that, but you still have to pinpoint them on a marsh as opposed to being in a pea field because you put a spinner on in a pea field and they're in your lap. Right. Different deal. Totally different deal. I think in a willow slew, it has a lot to do with wind direction. Okay. That also has a lot to do with a resting area. 
you know, a lot of those ducks will crawl up in the willows. There'll be branches. There'll be, it might be logs. They might be a little mud bar, a little shallow spot. A duck would rather stand than swim. Right. And so they'll land in a certain area, swim a little ways and like to get up on logs. You see them in Arkansas in the timber. Every time you go down there, you know, they're, that's really what they want to do. You know, same way with Canada geese on a river system or what have you big open water, they'll land out in the open water, but they really want to find a sandbar where they can go up, get out of the water, sleep without swimming. And so a lot of times those, even in a cattail area, there might be little to swill muskrat huts or whatever those ducks land, get up on them and rest, you know? So the X is so, so important. And the X is not the field. The X is where they're exactly at in that field. Way Isn't more that important. crazy? That's so crazy to me that, that, you could take the X and then dissect it down to the actual exact actual pin drop of, of a field that you're in where they were. But now you have to tell me that if you're not here, you're going to take a chance of missing those honkers. And if they start building up over here, then you're really screwed, right? You're done. You're done, done. Right. You might as yeah. well go eat. It's yeah. crazy to me that, that, that you could, that, now as a waterfowl hunter, you just acquired permission on the field they're in, but you forgot to know exactly where you need to set up. And this is for geese because ducks, you might be a hundred yards off and be able to pull them with a, with some calling no and, and, and mojos, right? Yep. No problem. No problem. Lesser, lesser as you can specs, uh, uh, snows, you can move them around the field a lot. Honkers, not so much, like almost impossible to be honest with you. Do you think that because of you, and, and people that have done what you've done in this industry that we have breeded a smarter goose because of the way decoys look and hiding. Have we made geese get smarter? Yeah, 100%. I mean, they've evolved as, as fast as we have. You know what I mean? I just remember I've been hunting, waterfowl hunting for, you know, 40 some plus years, 42, 40, 41 years I've been waterfowl hunting. And I, I know what the decoys look like. Cause I, you know, I talk to people now like, ah, you know, this decoy and that guy, I'm thinking, man, you should have seen what I hunted with when I was nine years old. You know, you just can believe the technology of clothes, guns, ammo, boats, blinds, decoys, everything has been just incredibly advanced compared to what it used to be old school. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but that stuff used to work because that's just what ducks were hunted over, you know, but as we progress, they must progress too, because if not, we'd hunt them to extinction, but that's not going to happen. That's going to happen because they evolve. And I think more so than any uh, is uh, geese. Now I've heard people say, well, Canada geese aren't that uh, smart, man. They live in town. You can walk right up to them and you can do all that stuff. I'll be honest with you. I think city geese, a lot of times they're so educated towards people that they're much can be much smarter to hunt or harder to hunt simply because they're just they're more educated with the mannerisms of of humans right and, and it, it went as far as this I, I think i told you a story one time but it's a quick story but it, it will change the way you look at geese and how smart they are i used to go down to this little park and i'd go down there and feed them right and there would be hundreds of them around me and i'd sit right in the middle of a couple hundred Canada geese, listen to them, I'd study them, understand the differences between them and how they interact and how they fight and how they're agitated and all that stuff. And I'd go down there. I showed up one time, um, I went down there, but I had my hunting coat on. Okay. Now I go, I would go there four times a week. I had my hunting coat on that day. I went down and sit down, all the geese are out there, started throwing food around. They wouldn't come, they wouldn't even come close to me. Going put tiles on. Didn't really realize what was going on. I was like, I don't know. Maybe someone already came down here and fed them because if somebody beats you to the park and feeds them, they're not as apt to swarm you. Right. So I go sit in a truck and I say, I'll let them just kind of, I was hanging out in the truck, letting them come up on their own. You know, I didn't think it was me. I just thought they'd already been fed. Car pulls up. This little girl gets out parents. She's like five years old. Got this little pink snowman outfit runs down there, starts throwing bread and they just swarm her. You know, I go, it's my coat. So I took the coat off. And went back out there and I could walk right up to them. Went back, put my camouflage coat on, walked back down there. They scattered. They knew the difference between a hunter and someone that wasn't hunting. And that was in like August or September in a park. In what so year? Sounds kind of odd, but man, I've seen it time and time and time again. The only what other year? bird that's smart is, is a crow, you know? You can right. walk right from crows in the city anywhere you go. Anytime you have anything that looks like a gun in your hand. Yep. It's like born knowing it. They're so yeah, smart. They know. They know. 
I would I would go as far as uh, and I, I know Chad's been with me on, on many occasions where we would just have too many geese decoy at one time, right? And especially hunting in the United States, um, and you're hunting maybe you're only hunting two or three hundred geese, right? And here comes a hundred or fifty or even twenty five or thirty. We're not going to shoot into them, not at all, unless we can kill almost all of them or at least half of them. There's no way we're going to shoot into them, and so they would land in the decoys, and I would actually lay down my ground blind with just a white shirt on okay and when they would land i would get up and walk out there with a white shirt i would go that far to try to make them not think that was a hunter now whether that made any sense or not it did to me and to be honest with you when i had regular pedestrian clothes on i could almost walk up to them you know but if you stood up with camouflage jacket they would just I wanted to try to make that experience as less impactful as possible. And I knew from feeding Canada geese and studying them that camouflage clothing was very, they would extremely frightened by it. So I would go the opposite way as much as possible. And those were city geese. <clears throat> well, city geese are even country geese. You know what I mean? Country geese are going to live on a pond, whether people come up and go fishing or a gravel pit where there's workers somewhere they're going to encounter people they're living on a river system or people come down with bass boats all the time fishing different deal freddie you open this gear issue this year it's in the mailbox right now and people see this i just section. got mine but i didn't have a chance yeah i was eating my ribeye and i didn't get all <laughs> one of your ribeyes <laughs> but but there's a blind section in there and there's panel blinds in that blind section and a, a guy you know he's 25 years old he's like oh man i watched avian x tv and boom freddie's killing him out of the out, out of his out of his panel blinds and it's not as easy as you as it comes off on tv sometimes what's the tutorial freddie how do you can you go in the center of a field with a panel blind can you oh, go yeah. in there with an a-frame blind and hunt in this no way can you hunt do you have to be by a pivot do you have to be by a telephone pole do you have to be by a rock pile and blend into that can you just go out there and put corn stalks in one and trick canada geese what is the tutorial the fred zinc instructional on how to get success out of an a-frame or a, or a tilt or a panel blind there's a couple things i'll tell you that i remember on my first i'm gonna try to i'm gonna try to show this here we go. I can show this, make this pretty simple. I remember the first time I made my first A-frame style lines uh, when I was 20 years old. They were fold up, modular fold up. Uh, and I used fast grass. Remember fast grass? You know, I, that's what I used as a cover. Um, and I did that because we couldn't kill them out of ground blinds. They were just educated. It's not that ground blinds not effective. It's just they get conditioned. It'd be like saying... I like the bass fish and everybody else bass fish and they only have a white spinner bait. Well, after about five years, everybody fishing with a white spinner bait, you can't catch a bass on a white spinner bait. That's no different than a ground blind. It's going to be no different than a panel blind or an A-frame moving forward. As more people buy them, geese are going to get more condition and it's going to have to move on to something else, right? That's the tricks in the bag. It's just something, it's the new toy. It's not that it's a toy. It's just really effective right now. But as they learn it, It'll get, excuse me, it'll get less and less effective. So the first uh, A-frames that I had built, designed them, developed them, bent all the metal up and all that, had some covers made. We did a trip to Kansas, Oklahoma. It was a three-week trip. And when we got back, uh, we'd killed 1,700 birds out of those. We had, had three of them, you know. And we were hunting in the middle of fields, and we were doing some things that we'd never done before, uh, ever, to be honest with you. And uh, it was amazing uh, how effective they were. They were warm, put heaters in there. You can shoot much better because you're standing up. For an outfitters with, with clients, especially older clients, it's a totally different experience. It's an experience to the point where a lot of people said, I'd rather shoot 20 you know, out of a, a stand-up blind than 80 out of a lay-down blind simply because of the fact it's more comfortable. I'm talking about older folks, right? And uh, so one key is to make sure you have it grasped properly, all right? Uh, there's a lot of different grass you can use. The one that works by far the best is called prairie cord grass, all right? It's extremely durable, and that's the most important part. It's not that it blends in better. It's just that it stays on your blind. Most people uh, will grass it up with maybe canary reed grass or what have you. It looks awesome for about three hunts, and then it doesn't look very good, and they don't ever continue to grass it. It's, it's a constant maintenance, but if you use prairie cord grass 
and you're hunting hard, you gotta you gotta redo it every once in a while or add to it. But man, you get there and you're dynamite, right? That's number one. Number two, what we found is is the more you hunt out of, the more blinds, the more effective. One blind in the middle of the field, not very effective. They seem to be pretty goofy. And if you do want to use one blind, I'd go in the, in the tree line and cut uh, uh, trees, small trees, and jam it in the ground and try to build an edge. I know you see that out west a lot uh, in the Pacific Northwest, right? To build an edge with tumbleweeds and stuff like that. I would do the same thing, but I'd use little willows and add grass and try to make it bigger than what it was and kind of make it look like it was built in, like a weed line or something. And very, very natural, you know, your non-broken line or whatever you were talking about. I'm trying to do that. Yeah. But as you add more blinds, it becomes more and more effective. Uh, Four, three to five blinds, you can hunt in the middle of the field. And if you grass it in properly, you can wear them out, man. I'm talking about like 10 yard shooting, 20 yard shooting. And on top of that, you all, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Freddie. All right. So here, here's the most important part of understanding how to use an A-frame. And this changes throughout the day, and you need to understand this because this will be the difference between success and not having much success. Or geese land at your feet, land at your feet, and all of a sudden they won't. All right, so see this business card right here? This is the most important part about lay down blind hunting, any type of blind hunting right here. It's shadowed right now, okay? That shadow is going to make the blind look black, right? So you have to catch sunlight with your blind so the birds can't see it. Now I'm going to start turning this business card. This is going to flare birds right here. But when I start turning it, my light's going to hit it. See where it turned white? Can you see that? Yep. Birds will land right next to that blind. Why? That blind there, no go. Because they have no idea it's there. They can't see it? They can't see it. The shadow is, the shadows is what caused in my opinion, in most hunts, when it comes to camouflage, shadowing is what is the biggest issue. That's that's the deal with ground blinds. When I figured out, um, I just thought they were getting conditioned to ground blinds. I thought they were kind of hard to see. And, uh, you know, like in water hunting, a lot of times in photography, videography, making TV, you want your sun to your back so, uh, uh, and the sun in their face, right? Because it blinds them, and it does. But when the sun's high, that's very effective. But when the sun is low, and you have ground blinds, every every ground blind is a dark hump. And you've been there many times where geese are just coming in, first flights are coming in. As the sun starts to set, and they really start coming in, they start to flare. So is it even is it even ground blinds start to shadow? Is it even worth? putting out a spread with ground blinds then when you're in Saskatchewan and you just traveled 1700 miles with your truck and trailer when it's overcast and a low ceiling and there's no sunshine at all and no chance of a shadow. Can you still, can you kill them in that, in that? Can, okay. Let's not even say Canada where they haven't seen a spread away, but in Ohio or Oklahoma, can you get them on a low overcast day with no shadows? It'd be tough in Ohio. It would be tough. Would if, you even if go? moisture in the air and there's like a blue hazy day, it'd be really, really tough. It's tough. But I'm talking about shooting them, decoying them. You know what I mean? Right in. Very, very tough. So, Freddie, let me ask you this. If you're a weekend warrior, if you're an everyday Fred Zink that makes us live in this industry, is it worth going out and educating the local population of geese or the migrating geese that might have just got there? Do you go out and even take a chance to educate them on a day that's a low ceiling when you know you only have a certain amount of days to hunt, but you know that if you just wait 24 hours and the sun's there, you're going to get them. But this day right here, you might push them into another field because they were picking you apart with no shadows? Uh I wouldn't hunt a day that I don't think I can get them. Like I am a hundred percent do what you just said. Like if, if I know it's going to be a difficult day and I, I have the field and I got locked up, I'm not going to hunt it. I'm going to wait till the conditions are right to go do it. Be, it's no different than trying to kill a big white tail, right? Wind's wrong. You don't hunt. You don't hunt a big white tail because you're going to move them out. Well, waterfowl are the same way. Now, if you're a weekend warrior and you only have so many days, Hey man, go try it. Right. But if you have the opportunity and you and you have the flexibility per se, I wouldn't hunt unless the conditions are this right. This is so important, Freddie, to, to success. And you you know you know because you've done it, you've been there, done that. But how important is what you're talking about? And I know we're talking about hiding, but I remember vividly we were at a Cabela's Classic 
Avery Waterfowl panel. I was on the panel with you. Travis Mueller was the MC. He was taking the questions from the audience and they posed this question and I went first. They said, Chad, what's your favorite day to hunt? And I said, I love snow on the ground, fresh snow, bluebird skies, cold out, and those geese and ducks coming off and I'm, I'm ready for them. And then they go, Fred Zink, your, your turn. And you went, well, I like what Chad said, but I will hunt the day before when that pressure's dropping and that storm's coming in and those birds are like, I got to get to the buffet. I remember it like it was yesterday. And this is 10, 12, 15 years ago that I remember you quoting this. Is that still stay true with you? How important is being able to be a, a duck, a duckologist, a meteorologist and being able to pick the right days to get the ultimate success? Is, is, Do you is, remember is, that when you said that? Yeah, in that yeah, yeah, 100 percent. It. Predi weather is everything and hunting waterfowl. Now, when you're in Canada, uh, it still plays into it. But I'm talking about after the birds have been educated and they're in in the you know in the Midwest uh, on the eastern shore of Maryland, where there's a ton of hunting pressure and areas where they get hunted a lot. Uh, weather is the key, and it's uh, to, to you all of you guys out there that uh, are whitetail hunters. It's the exact opposite of what you would want whitetail hunting, and so. I'm a lifelong waterfowl hunter, hunter, and I started hunting whitetails pretty a lot, probably about six, seven years ago. And it didn't take me long to figure it out because it was the exact opposite of what I had learned um, waterfowl hunting. So what I'm saying is waterfowl move during that storm. When the wind's blowing and right before it, they move hard and they'll feed hard for a couple of days. But soon as that storm is over and it snows and the next day it's crystal clear, sunny, and it's calm, they won't move. They won't move, especially Canada goose, because a Canada goose is dark, right? So it absorbs heat. So Canada goose will sit on a sunshiny day, especially when it's cold. If it gets around 15, 10, 15 degrees or colder, especially if it's zero, which we get a lot of times here in the Midwest, uh, they won't fly until... The, the coldest part of the day they sit there because they're brown and they are not they absorb all the heat they're really warm if you could touch them and this is a good test flocking will do the same thing on decoy so next time you're out there and it's 20 degrees 15 degrees grab your can of goose decoy by the head put your hand on the bill the beak which is black and it's cold put your hand on the flocking it's warm it's the same deal with a can of goose they can, even in zero temperature, they can remain very warm without feeding, right? So that's when they'll start to only feed one time per day, and they'll typically sit until the cold, it starts to get cold, right? So it's warm and warm and warm, and as soon as it starts to fall, they'll get up and go feed, right? So it's a timing deal. It could be two, three o'clock in the afternoon, noon. A lot of times it's last light. They'll get up, go out and feed, and come back, and they'll feed one time per day. So hunting the weather system is, hunting if it's raining you know uh, the best time to field hunt is on moisture days because a lot of times they'll go there and they'll sit all day in fields you don't want to be on the water on the lake and your boat blind on a rainy day not going to probably work out too good for you and just the opposite i wouldn't be hunting all day in a field when it's sunny you know what i mean they're going to come to the field but it ain't going to be a great hunt i'd rather be on the water i'm going to move a lot more in those conditions Tell me then what happened on this day for me. We scouted this pothole in Oklahoma loaded with mallards coming from the heavens, bombing in there like it was their job. They were coming, they were coming from a peanut field. We set up on this pond the next day. We knew it was going to be awesome. Blue skies, but the temperature was going to be about a 20 degree difference to the colder. It was not going to get above freezing and the lows were 10, 12 degrees. Put the ice eaters in there. It was beautiful sunshine. We knew this was going to be magic. Saw two ducks the whole day. There was 5,000 ducks on this pond the night before. Went to the big water. They were all out there, sitting there, rafted up, never moved. These are mallards, never moved. Is this because a duck can sense that if they get up off of their roost that it will freeze and lock them out of there and they can go without eating? Is it because they have to keep that water open? I think I think you're spot on right there. I've seen it in can. I see it here. I see it here all the time in Ohio. Uh, as those ducks... They know that the storm, I mean, they're better weather men than, than our weather people, right? They know how typically how long that storm's going to last. A lot of times they'll wait it out. And you're right. If they get up and go to that field and feed, when they come back, it's probably going to be froze. So a lot of times they won't leave or they'll take turns leaving, right? 
you got caught in, in the bait and switch area on that hunt. What you were hunting was, you know, which is what we like to hunt in Canada and Oklahoma is uh, we don't hunt roost ponds. We'll hunt a, what I call a watering pond where they just go to the field, stay there for an hour and then get up and go get water and then back to the field. You're not blown a roost. You're not hurting anything. And it's magical because it's nonstop traffic all day. As long as they're feeding, they're coming back and forth. Typically, I like to be downwind in a watering pond of where they're feeding. So that big water was stuffed with ducks because they knew that if they got up and go, their home's gone. They're out of their house. Their house is frozen. Uh, yeah. And yep. they don't want to sit on this little pond because they don't they don't have the security of predators and they don't have the the san, you know kind of like that sanctuary feeling right that big water is where they like to raft up and stay safe out there that's right. and that's that's all I could attribute to I'm like they got to be starving they got to be hungry they haven't eaten in 24 hours and they never came off of that big water yep. but as soon as it started to warm back up it was like and it was like the, the bell went off and the buffet said the you know the, the mama rang the dinner bell and that peanut field was loaded up again it's it's so crazy to me that that just that one day you put all that work in and you're like oh my god i'm the worst duck hunter in the world and we could have looked like all stars if we just would have waited a day or a couple days you know and let that storm right. pass but when you're in that environment like do you have a favorite do you have a favorite setup zinc of where that panel blinds going to be your go-to? I want to talk about ducks for a second on water. Can you consistently hide on an, uh, on a pond's edge? Can you, can you get in the water and actually get out in front of the toolies? How, how can a guy be successful if he wants to, if he doesn't just want to sit on a, on a toolie seat in the toolies, can you utilize a panel blind to be successful over water for ducks? Yeah, I actually on the edge a lot of times of a marsh or e even in the marsh. And we've done it a lot of times in the Midwest where we'll be somewhere and we find ducks and they're maybe they're hunt, hitting a public marsh or what have you. And but we don't have our boat line with us. But a, fr a friend might have a John boat. Right. So we'll take our A-frames right out there, get out. It might be knee deep or whatever. Go ahead and set our blinds up, set them right in the water. Right. Sit on stool, march stools and hunt them just like you would uh, anything. But you're just like waders. Right. So you're sitting in water, but it's just right, right about your knees. And so very, very effective. Uh, when I'm hunting water, uh, I'm not so much worried about shadow as much. That that plays a little bit. But I want the sun. Uh, more in the duck's eyes or geese because every, every time we go fishing right we always wear sunglasses because of the glare and that's really important it's really important in layout boat hunting uh you want the sun at a certain angle you want the sun in their eyes because they it's a glare and they can't see very well at all and so all they're seeing is decoys bouncing around and they can't really see they're basically blinded and like right here behind my house on uh, Sandusky Bay, you get the right conditions. When the mallards are right there, they could be 10 yards from your layout boat. And you're just laying there in the middle of the water, right? And the lay down boat, and you're like, you can't believe they can't see you because they're just right there. And when you set up, if you set up slow, they won't even flare. They're that blinded by the sun. So using the glare on the water is extremely important. You can still use that shadowing effect, right? You can still just can't your blinds just a little bit more. And you got to anticipate when you're setting that blind up on an angle where it's not shadowing, shadow, no shadow, or where the sun's going to be when the ducks come, right? So you want to set it up, the sun comes up, it's like, hey, we're not shadowing and an hour later when the ducks come, now the sun's behind you. So you got to anticipate that prior to setting your blinds up. Very important as well. It's amazing the thought process that goes into the success of a daily, of, of getting consistent success the things that you're talking about are not you can't learn that without going and you know like what drew said at honey break on the job training like even me at, at at as many duck and goose hunts as i've been on in the last 20 years starting with you and where i am today is like i never think about what is going to happen I always think about, well, if I let the sun get up a little bit more, but I'm never dictating the positioning of my spread or my blinds or my kill hole or my mojos or everything. When that's key, you're making it to where it's key element in forecasting the hunt. Skip, are you listening to this to where like you literally could be off by 45 minutes of magic and just subpar cross shooting uh, some mallards or geese? It could be a, a matter of minutes and in, in literally inches is what you're saying, Zinc. Yeah, it is. The angles of everything really, really matter, to, uh, to be honest with you. And I didn't learn this by using a shotgun. I learned it by trying to video. 
making TV, making videos all those years, consistently trying to land birds, uh, you know, shitloads of them right at our feet time and time and time again. Uh, that's where all the detail, that's where I, I, I learned a lot of that. Cause you got, as you well know, you got a lot of money on the line. You got camera guys, you got a big crew traveling. You're up there for two, three weeks. You're in the Midwest, what have you. And you're spending thousands and thousands of dollars. And the difference between a great TV show and an okay TV show is paying attention to detail. So, you know, if I, if I would have never videoed and got into TV and, and the video side of things, I probably wouldn't know half the stuff that I know because I call it, uh, there's a difference between having 40 yard knowledge and having 10 yard knowledge. Uh, when you have a shotgun, you don't need, tend to need to have a 10 yard knowledge because you don't have to get them that close. But when you're videoing and making TV, you have to be able to do that. And so that's just a difference. You know, I, I don't mind shooting geese at 30 yards, right? It's kind of fun because we shoot them so many times at 10 or 15. It's not much of a challenge. Uh, so when I go out and, and hunt now, man, when they cut across the pit at 40 or 50, I love to rain them out like when I was a kid, you know, I miss the wing shooting aspect of it. It's pretty cool too. There's two different things, wing shooting and decoying. In my opinion, it's two different things. And at this stage in your waterfowling career and in your life, being in your 40s, do you prefer one over the other? You kind of just alluded to the fact that you'd rather wing shoot at this stage in your life? Well, I kind of like to do both because I've done the other professionally for so long. Uh, and it's very challenging, obviously, but I, I miss wing shooting because I never, for, you know, for 30 years, 25, 25 years, I didn't get to per se wing shoot. You know, I had to shoot everything at 10 to 20, 25 yards you know, and then maybe shoot a cripple going out or whatever. But after they flared out, we wouldn't shoot them at 35 or 40 flared out because they might fall out of the camera. Right. And so we're, we're there to do a job. And that was to try to number one, make good TV and make it to where people got excited about it and wanted to go hunting, you know, and try to leave waterfowl hunting better than what we uh, uh, found it. And also, promoter product. So there's a lot of things going on there, but like that picture behind you, that's what I'm used to seeing day in, day out when we're video hunting. But when you're just hunting, you don't have to see that to be successful. Does it still get you excited to know what you've accomplished, Freddie, in the blinds, like we're talking about in the gear issue right now, the decoy world, the call world? I mean, you've, you've, you've been there, done that on the stage and in the field, and you've coached some of the best competition callers of all time. You've had them as full-time employees. You've mentored and been an inspiration and influence to so many waterfowlers. When you see a picture like that behind me, that's in Kansas, which you've hunted a lot. Lester's in Kansas outside of Wichita is amazing, right? Does it still yeah. get your candle going? Do you, like Jimbo says, if that don't light your wood, or if that don't light your your fire, your wood's wet. Does it still right. get you fired up because you've seen it so many times? And I know I've asked you that before, but does it, did, did you think about it when you're walleye fishing? Do you think about it when you're hanging with the family at the pizza parlor? Do you think about it when you're watching Gunner play ball? Does waterfowl still control Fred Zink's mind somewhat? Oh yeah. A hundred percent. I don't really think about, uh, my accomplishments or with the products I've designed. Uh, I'm more thinking about the hunts hunts and things that I've seen and people that I've met and, you know, hunts that you and I've been on. And I still think of those way more than, you know, decoys that I've developed or blinds or what have you. That's part of the game, but all that stuff was, yeah, it was to make money and, and everybody's got to make money. Right. But I never really made them. I have never made a product that I made it just to make money. I always tried to make a product. So I personally seems kind of selfish could be more successful, right? I have to go up there and think it's like, man, these geese are doing this or ducks are doing this. Maybe if we did this, we could be more successful. And then figuring that out and proving it out and prototyping it out and, and learning how to use it and then taking it to the market. So other people could be successful. Probably what feeds me more than anything is just, I just like to see them back flapping, man. Oh, That's I pretty love cool. It. That's what I like. Skip, I kind of feel like I'm in an episode of uh, Matt Locke or some uh, courtroom show to where the judge is getting ready to turn it over to the defense. I like, I've asked all the questions I have of our witness here with Fred Zink. It's, and you're sitting there kind of taking it all in. Are you, are you visualizing what Freddie's painting this masterpiece of Skip Knowles? Are you taking mental notes uh, and learning from the master himself? Do you have a line of questioning or why are you being so quiet? Is it, is it enthralling to listen to somebody like Fred Zink lay down knowledge like this? Cause I consider it unbelievable to have it uh, the, the way we 
can get content today to learn this unbelievable, fascinating lifestyle of waterfowl hunting. And we got somebody like Zinc on here laying it down. Are you sitting there just like shaking your head like, holy shit, like we're really listening to this and it's happening? Or what's going through your mind? It's your turn. You can you can take the courtroom. You, know, uh, you know how much I love interacting with everyone, like all the other podcasts we did today. Uh, but with Fred, I just tend to just sit there and soak it in because there's not many people like him. Uh, he's such an affable, easygoing, likable, fun guy. He's always slapping me on the back every time he sees me. And um, you forget that he's just this unbelievable, deep wellspring of knowledge. He, and he, whenever he opens his mouth, you start to learn. And uh, there's so much I want to ask him, but um, you're too busy just soaking it all in. But what I, Fred, I'd like to ask you, taking it way big picture, you know, everyone used to hunt in little blinds in the fields. And then you invented the layout, good grief, two and a half decades ago. And uh, then the geese got wise to that. And now we're going back to panel blinds and people are putting um, brown tumbleweed brush blinds in Texas in the middle of winter wheat fields, which stand out like a like a, a banana in a bowl of fudge, you know, and killing the hell out of geese again. Do you think we've come to the, the precipice of innovation? It's for people who aren't inventive like you, they, we tend to think, okay, you know, there's nothing else we can do. There's no more calls that can be developed. Do you feel like there's another level of something like the layout blind, wait, the ground line waiting to be invented or discovered out there? Or do you really feel like Damn it, the geese are as smart as whitetails, especially the honkers. I call them sky coyotes. There's a lot of there's a lot of comparisons there. They've moved into the cities. They continue to expand the range. They're immeasurably harder to kill. Um, the, the sky coyotes, you know. And uh, do you feel like we're just waiting on the next big ground blind discovery type thing? That there's still things out there that are going to enable us to dial it back to 1995. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. You know, with the evolution of of the final approach blinds with uh, Ron Latchall and what he was able to bring to the table, and then there was many uh, the finisher blind uh, that I that I designed and developed, and the Power Hunter blinds. Those were ground blinds that were effective, but they were also portable for people that could walk in or people that had trailers or back and pickup trucks, just more accessible for the average hunter. You know, but it always evolves. There's, there's blinds, you know, I, I have designs and, and thought processes of blinds that to be honest with you, I haven't developed uh, because it's not time to develop them yet. Uh, there's a little bit of throwing the anchor out every once in a while, because as long as you're effective and there's products out there where you can be effective, why dilute uh, something out? You know what I mean? You got to hold, you gotta hold, you gotta hold things back to be successful, long-term hunting waterfowl because you just can't throw it out because eventually you're going to run through too many different things. Same way with decoys or calls, especially blinds. Uh, that's one thing. Number two, it's how you uh, use the blinds that are currently out there. You know what I mean? It's just like you can go and I can go buy a baseball bat, you know, just, just like Hank Aaron uh, used, but we can't use it like Hank Aaron. Right. And so, using a normal ground blind in effective ways of hiding up against standing beams or hiding in shadows or in low areas in the field or making edges with ground blinds or panel lines or what have you. There's just all these different uh, techniques that you can use to take in blind that might not be effective for most and make it effective by doing things that other people aren't doing. And that's the key. That's the key to, that's definitely the key to waterfowl hunting is you got to be effective techniques but they need to be different uh in your given area than the majority of people so for instance in your backyard skip if you have an outfitter that's running 10 dozen silhouette decoys and he's hunting out at uh, avian x uh, a frames and all this stuff the last thing you want to do is do that you want to do the exact opposite of what he's doing because he's there every day pounding them conditioning those birds for a certain type of hunting you need to be the exact opposite of that you need to have four dozen full bodies and be hunting out ground blinds and doing something different than what he's doing. And that's how things can change. So when we go to Canada, we got ground blinds in the, in the uh, trailer. We got ghillie blankets in the trailer. We have A-frames in the trailer and we go 30 hours, we get up there or so we go to Oklahoma or whatever. And we're there and there's a couple outfitters that moved in that we didn't know about and they're doing certain things. We need to be able to change because if it didn't work today, and you're in a given area, it probably is not going to work for them. So yeah, when, it change. I've even heard of uh, like in, in Northern Colorado, Kansas in late season, 
um, the geese will start avoiding cornfields and they'll we'll shoot geese who like caked mud. And, and the thing to do is to try to learn to hunt the dirt, even if you got to be all white to do it, yeah. you know, because they'll actually yeah. start to avoid the, the cornfields, which is just crazy because you'll see guys sky bust into flocks of 500 and just made all those geese impossible to kill at 70 yards, you know? So the, the, the ground blind subject, I think where I learned more about ground blinds, I knew they become very ineffective in most cases simply because, and when I would do seminars at Cabela's back in the day, they would be, and Chad would be there. We'd have uh, the Avery events there. They'd be 100, 200, 300 people there, right? And I'd say, how many people here have a ground blind? In the early days, it'd be maybe 10% of the people. Now, when you would go there in the last five years, seven years, 10 years, you would ask that, and it'd be a 10% of the people not have them. 90% of them raise their hands. Well, the geese got conditioned to them. And uh, so with that being said is when we started, when the, when the uh, evolution of drones with cameras came out, we were doing decoy tips, right? So we'd fly that drone around, say like a big snow goose spread, right? We'd fly around, show them the teardrop, the open hole, the open uh, a U pattern, whatever we were using or lesser spread or what have you. And we were flying around. I was blown away by how easy ground blinds were to see on uh. 180 degrees. Like 180, invisible. One side, the sun sh- side. The shadow side, unbelievably easy to see from above. They l- literally look like trash dumpsters in the middle of a field, like square boxes. So easy to see. It's unbelievable because of shadows, not because of camo, not because they weren't grassed. None of that is because of shadows. So that's the kind very, of very, very, very easy to see from a bird from at certain angles, extremely easy. So if you're a waterfowl hunter and you're a blind hunter, you have to sit down and learn shadowing and, and how to use it to your advantage. Right. hundred percent. Right. Like this is, this is a lesson to take out of this friends think is how important shadows are, because I remember hunting with you like, all right, this is the shadow side. We're going to put decoys on this side because of this. We're going to put down feeder decoys here because we want to emulate the food is in this area. We're going to put a stand up in between the blinds just to break us up a little bit. There's, there's thought process and theory to paint in that picture to when the geese come off that roost and they come into that field and they're moving their heads back and forth and you're flagging and there's a little bit of a breeze and your decoys are waddling a little bit. You're really really trying to get them as close as you can to kill them with ethical harvestable shots. There's a thought process that goes into that, that is, that is thought out way before they leave that roost. And that's what we want to try to get out to the waterfowl hunters is that even though you watch Fred Zink do it day in and day out on TV, there's been thousands of hours that have gone in to picking that apart and doing forensic audits on this of why am I successful? It does not happen overnight. It's so difficult to achieve consistent success in waterfowling. And I say that not to scare people away from it. I say it to get into it for the right reasons, to learn how to be the best, the most efficient and to, and to create consistent success for you. And that it's very difficult to do And the way that you're laying it down. That's why the people are failing. In my opinion, why I have failed is because I have not thought of all of those intricate details that go in to be, to getting that success. And Skip, you might think of it different, but that's what I'm taking out of this conversation in the gear issue is that somebody's going to open that up and go, Oh man, brand new blind. I'm going to wax them with that. And then they're going to get it out there and they're going to be like, Oh gosh, I didn't get them. Like I thought I would, when I saw this picture of this blind in this magazine and zinc's laying it down of how to get there. Would you agree with that? Skip Knowles? Yeah, I do. And it's really, he really got me thinking with that uh, comparison about how geese are savvy to camouflage in some since instances, the way crows are um, incredibly gun shy of anyone carrying so much as a stick. And there's like, they're born with that knowledge. And the idea that you have to completely mud or cover all your layout lines and no longer rely on your old max four camo on your, on your uh, layout line or your jacket. It's, it's a, uh, it's an eye opener to realize that the geese are on to camo. And that's, and that's what makes it so fun, right? The challenge in that everyday thinking process of becoming a better waterfowl hunter. Yeah. Yeah. Fred, and, and thank all you, birds man. are different. I mean, you can, there's some, certain areas where you can go there and you can park your truck in the middle of the field and they'll land next to you. Okay. Or if you have a certain weather front, like it gets real, real cold and it's going to be cold for a while and it's snowing and it's a day where the food, you know, they're in panic mode. That's a totally different deal. That those days are, are magical because of the weather. It's nothing that you've done. Right. It's not that you're blowing your goose call ride or blowing your duck or decoys. No, 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 no. 
they're hungry and you happen to be in a sport they want to be, right? That's a magical day. But you're talking about day in, day out, doing it from coast to coast, Canada, all the way to Oklahoma, day in, day out. All those little details of knowing where the birds are at, where they're feeding, where the food's not out, how to use your decoys, shadowing, blinds, calling, no calling, flagging, all that stuff. And you have to mix it up. You got all these tools. You just know how to use them and which tools to get out of the truck that day. And it changes. And that's what I've been so fortunate. I know, Chad, you have been too, to be able to have an opportunity to hunt all over. And I didn't learn all this stuff on my own. I learned a lot by watching the birds themselves. I was probably, when I was younger, I would spend a tremendous amount of time with the birds themselves in their natural environment to understand them. But by having the opportunity to go hunt, say I get in a truck and I drive to drive out to your place, Chad, it's in your backyard. I'm not going to set decoys. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let you set them and I'm going to watch how you set them. And I'm going to try to learn something because the minute that I think I've learned it all is the minute that I don't know shit. Right. And so the reason why I would drive all the way out and hunt with you is because you know what you're doing in your own backyard. Right. So I have one philosophy and I, and I think a lot of people would learn by this simple term, don't ever guide the guide. Okay. And unless he's terrible and it's easy to see, but typically if, if he's a friend of yours and does it professionally, he knows more about hunting in your area and his area than you probably do. Okay. I've seen a lot of writers yeah. um, go to places and uh, I don't know, they have this in, imperious attitude trying to act like a know it all until tell yeah. the guy, try and act like they're dope in the wind, throw stuff in the air and say, yeah, we really need to be over here. And, and it's yeah. just always ends in tears, man. You just yeah, don't yeah. ever try and beat someone on their home turf. Just but you can, you can always just, you can learn from so many different people. And I've taken things from the East coast that I've learned from people over there and people in Canada and, and just people all over the United States. And I've learned a tremendous amount from watching with my eyes and not my mouth. You know, that's why my dad said, you got two eyes and one mouth. There's a reason for that. Right. Yeah. I like to observe people and how they do it. Waterfowl in their natural environment. And I like to learn versus like dictate things, you know? Yeah. I, I, th I think I, I really learned that lesson too, is, you know, the, the mystique of Arkansas and the flooded timber. We got to go there. It's the land of the ducks. Then you go there and you get three days in a row of overcast and you're like, this ain't that good. But then as soon as that shadow happens in the sun and you're yeah. just like, Oh wow. Because you literally could be wearing pink or fluorescent green doing jumping jacks in a sunlit day in the Arkansas timber and light 200 of them on your, on your head. Right. And then you yeah, get, you right. get, a, you get a cloudy day and they won't work to save your life. And it just shows you that you could be in the land of ducks and not kill them. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Just by waiting today. Not getting right on the water where Chad can hit him, you know. Hey, whatever it takes, Skip Knowles. Fred Zink, thank you so much. It was unbelievable. Skip, did you get some information for the gear issue on blinds? Is this the podcast? We, we set out to get information from the man himself, Fred Zink, on blinds, who's been pretty much responsible for the ground blind revolution with Ron Latchaw. He helped to really revolutionize the panel blind again and, and putting out video on Avian TV to show people that you can kill him in a stand-up panel blind. And now he just alluded to the fact that he might have something else up his sleeve that we might be seeing in the next 12, 24, 48 months. I don't know when it's going to happen, but the way, if I'm a, a betting man, which I am in this state that I live in, Fred Zink might have a couple tricks up his sleeve that we're going to get uh, privy to in the next couple of years. Skip Knowles, did you get everything out of this podcast that you set out to do for the gear issue? Yeah, and I'm excited. Fred's going to wait until, you know, you and I really get frustrated and desperate to buy stuff until we're really not killing birds. He's going to break out this new, uh, this new weapon that I, uh, interrogated him about, but yeah, I really did. He got me thinking not about the blind or the latest camouflage or the structure of the blind itself, but how to use everything. And that's, that's the approach that's going to make the difference for all of us. I just don't want people to be too intimidated. We talked a lot about things that were, that were difficult. I'd like Fred to give us a, an encouraging word, um, to depart for people who might find this all a little overwhelming about how they can be successful out there using blinds too. Despite, despite the fact that the geese are onto us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You just got to understand hunt, hunting the weather system, like Chad says, picking, picking your time to hunt is definitely going to sway the, 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 uh, the odds in your favor. You know, if it's going to be a bluebird day, it's going to be 55 and not much wind, not, not a really good day to go on a Canada goose hunt. Um, 
picking the time, the weather, that's the most important part, understanding the birds themselves. But uh, you just got to hide. You know what I mean? You can, if all you have is ground blinds, you can be a very effective. You can put them together in clumps. You can grass them heavy, over grass them to where it looks like an edge. Uh, you can hunt up against a fence row. You can, you can be very, very successful if all you have is ground blinds. If you don't have ground blinds, you can be successful uh, making your own natural blinds. Chad's been with me many, many times at a duck marsh in Canada, a uh, grass marsh where we cut in willow trees and grass everything up, sit down and you know sh shoot 60 drake mallards in the face uh, with no blind what, whatsoever. You know, just the old school of blending in, understanding nature and um, using the tools of the trade, even using burlap, laying down with burlap, uh, with grass on top of it or netting or what a gilly suit. You don't have to have expensive blinds to be successful. And you don't have to have a lot of decoys. If you're hunting local honkers with most of these people uh, probably listening to this podcast, a lot of people on there hunting local honkers. Uh, if you have good quality decoys and you do your scouting, just remember one thing, you can be extremely successful with six decoys, right? You don't need, because you, if you've done your homework, if you, go, if you don't go there, those geese are still going to go to that field. You go there and set 100 decoys and five or six blinds or whatever, they might not come to that field. If you go out there with six decoys, one or two people, hunters there, blend in, dig a shallow pit, use gilly blankets, burlap uh, blankets, ground blinds or whatever, hunt on the edge, you can shoot geese. You don't have to have a trailer full of decoys uh, like we all do to be successful. We have it because number one, we're in the business. Number two, we travel all over, all over the United States. Um, and some places you do need that to compete with it, but you don't, you don't have to have all that stuff, you know, um, you don't have to be a great goose caller. Sometimes the best call grounds used to say, uh, he'd say, Hey bud, nobody home. That means no calling can be very, very, very successful. Um, uh, especially if you're not a good caller. A call is probably the biggest conservation tool ever <laughs> and ever made in ever. the hands of someone not very skilled. And now we have to learn how to be on the X within the X, which I love that. I'm taking that. I'm going to yeah. start studying that. I think that's huge. And now I'm starting to question all my early season, Minnesota, Western Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, early honker hunts where I go in there and I'm like, we're going to wax them tomorrow, but we're going to hide 150 yards over this way. Cause we could get by this bluff. And then all of a sudden the geese are landing over there and it's like, dude, you haven't seen a decoy spread. Why aren't you coming in here? I sound like a goose. We look like geese. And they're like, well, it's because we know exactly where we want to be in this wheat field. You know, it's just, it's crazy to think of all the dimensions it takes to be yeah. successful. But I think that we need to do this, Freddie, you keep this in mind, post-COVID, maybe the fall of 2021, September 20th through October 10th, maybe we head up to Grants and we reconvene on Saskatchewan when we don't have to worry about the virus or international travel or yeah. the border being closed. Let's make a plan to do that and go up. Maybe we'll be product testing something that you're getting ready to release or launch to the public. But I appreciate you being here the gear issues better with these podcasts in my opinion because they get to hear it out of your mouth from all those years of experience and i think that that's key that it's the page is there it's cool it looks pretty in a magazine there's some lingo in there to read skip does a great job of laying it out with his team at osg but to hear it and to know how to use that panel blind and that ground blind is it's not easy and it's so key to get this this not just just instructional but inspiration to go out be ortho unorthodox, think outside the box, be clever, be witty with your personality, negotiate with those birds. That's really what we're in. We're in a negotiation with these geese <laughs> and these ducks and we're trying to close the deal. So I think it's awesome to have this and I appreciate it. You got any closing words, Skip? No, he nailed it. That's what I needed to hear, you know, some encouragement and um, a reminder to, to uh, use your imagination out there and stay creative. Yeah, 100%. It's, we, we're just out there to have fun. I love it more than anything. Uh, I just never get tired of it. I've been doing it forever and I can't wait. Uh, yesterday I was planting millet out in my duck club and I just can't wait to see the birds coming in there every night and going out there and enjoying that time. And that's what waterfowl hunting is about. It's about having fun, about hanging out with your friends. Uh, there's a lot of story, a lot of, a lot of my best friends I met hunting all over the United States and Canada. Uh, just think outside the box, be smart, understand that, uh, all those new products in the, in the gear issue are the best new innovative products. Um, just got to learn how to use them and uh, pay attention to some detail. That's the most important part about being different and being successful in the waterfowl world. 
the gear issues in your mailbox right now. It's on the bookshelves right now. Get it. Learn. Listen to these podcasts. Thank you so much for listening. We have a great panel. Fred Zink is unbelievable source of information, a wealth of information. Thank you for the subscriptions, the downloads. We truly appreciate you supporting the partners and sponsors that support our brands here at The Foul Life. Wild Foul Gear Issue 2021 Duck Season. It's upon us. The dog days of summers are almost over. We got to get through July and August. And there's even people that are going to be hunting Canada geese come August 15th the 95 degree weather but then what then what what do you do with them after you shoot them in august when it's 98 i'm out on that deal but i appreciate everybody that does it stay after them stay ethical stay safe hope everybody's having a great summer we pr- truly appreciate you tuning in to the foul life podcast wild foul series get your gear issue right now tom hit that button this is 2 a.m logic the song is called my foul life 